Okay, good evening everyone. Good evening. And good evening to the, uh, the web audience as well. Um, so I welcome you to a yet another uh, session, the ongoing saga of the Wednesday Night Live. And tonight's topic is, uh, does power corrupt the issue of leadership, power, and arrogance? So as many of you know, or may have heard of these classes, the Torah is a blueprint for life. That's its primary function. Not a history book, and not just a story book and inspiration, but actual blueprint. That's the words used in the Medrash to describe the Torah, just as an architect uses a blueprint by which he or she follows and all the contractors and construction plans follow the blueprint. So too, God, the cosmic architect of the universe, used the Torah as his blueprint. So in a sense, if you really want to know what makes the universe tick, what makes each of us tick, our so-called building blocks of existence, building blocks of each of us as an individual, the Torah is the blueprint by which, through which we were created. So there's an expression, Zeish Teras Adam, or Zeish Sefer told us Adam, that the Torah is essentially an x-ray, or as I said, a blueprint of human consciousness, of the human psyche. So though when you read the biblical stories, ostensibly on a superficial level, it's a story about people that lived in biblical times several millennia ago, different part of the world. And different commentaries explain the different dimensions of Torah's message. But in essence, as the commentary, for instance, Nachmanides, or other mystical commentaries explain, that the Torah essentially is a spiritual document and an x-ray of existence. It's like a CAT scan of God's mind through which he created this universe. So when you dig a little deeper, or you learn to demystify the cryptic code of the Bible, called the Mosaic Code sometimes, you learn literally the secrets of existence, the secrets of what makes us who we are, what shapes our lives, what defines history. Obviously, without eliminating free will, this is information that helps us understand ourselves better. And that's why it's well worth our time and investment and energy to study Torah. That is why Jews have been studying Torah for thousands of years, and they see it as a lifeline. When Rabbi Akiva was asked by one of his Roman um, peers, why is it that the Jews are so committed to Torah study, and they were at a time where they were trying to pass decrees that Torah should be forbidden, whatever for the reason there was, whether it was just plain anti-Semitism, or they saw it as a threat, or uh, what the communists later would call religion as being the opium of the masses, Marx. So Rabbi Kiva gave us an answer with an analogy. The analogy the Talmud tells is of a fox who was hungry for a meal, so the sly fox came to the river bank and called out to the fish and said, Fish, why don't you come spend some time with me on earth here, on land? You spend your whole life in the water, change of venue, something new, something novel, something uh, you haven't tried before. And the fish cried out, this is the metaphor, and returned to the fox, they responded, little fox, they say you're so smart, don't you realize that if we come out of the water, we cease to exist, because water is our sustenance, and we can't separate from the water. It's not about having fun and trying new things. There are things that are sustenance and things that are not sustenance. 
Obviously, the fox wasn't interested in their uh, entertainment. It was just in a good meal. So Rabbi Akiva said the, basically the same thing. But that's a very strong statement. To say that the Torah is like water, sustenance, and without it, it's like a fish out of water, that's death, is a strong statement. Even people who study the Bible all the time, and there are people who do so, for years and years, after the, through yeshiva experience, going to school, and then later, continue through classes, and you see people's commitment to the classes, and so on and so forth. Even if you ask those devout students and scholars, is it like being a fish out of water? So yes, some people may be addicted, so to speak, or be com completely uh, passionate and committed to uh, study all the time. As a matter of fact, it says in the Talmud that the Moses decreed that three days should not go without reading the Torah. So we read the Torah on Shabbat and Shabbos, on Mondays and on Thursdays. Why? Because a person can't go three days without water. And since Amai Mela Torah, Torah is compared to water, as I just said. So just like a body can't function three days without water, we go three days without Torah would be spiritual death. But then ask many people, they say, is that true? There are many people who do go three days without water. Without Torah, rather. <laughs> and even those that don't, is it really that type of sustenance or is it a habit? They're used to it, comfortable with it, stimulating. The answer is that unless you understand the Torah's deeper message, we can't really see it as our sustenance until you see the way it nourishes us. When you read the Bible, on a, as I said, on an ostensible level, literally, it may be an important story, it may be a historical story, nostalgic, telling us about our ancestors, how we got here, but water... That's a far cry from saying it's your sustenance right now. Therefore, we have to say that the Torah has a deeper message, and only when you see its deeper message do you see that relevance. And I use the word indispensable, relevant, indispensable relevance. No different than a fish outside of, in, in, within water. And the only way to see it that way is by looking at the stories and seeing how it tells us the story of our lives. So imagine if you were able to read chapter after chapter, and verse after verse, and line after line, in the Torah, and see, it's the story of your life unfolding, you start asking yourself, how does the Torah know this? It's not just about its um, prescience, but it's more importantly, that the Torah actually has guidelines, insights, that if you truly know how to read it, it's better than all the therapy in the world, all the insights that you've ever heard, psychological, emotional, spiritual, because it is a blueprint of who you are. So I know it's a big statement I'm making, and it puts the burden of proof on me to establish and make a case like this. But I wouldn't be sitting here and wasting my time or your time if I didn't think it was an indispensable uh, message. Because we're all busy people, and we have many options, especially in New York City. There's a lot to do every given night. Um, whether it's uh, quality things to do or less quality is another story, but there's plenty to do. So my respect for, yourself, for you, all of you, and for myself as well, and for the web audience included now, is such that I would not want to waste your time or my time in just talking about things that are optional. And it's truly vital, therefore, to challenge ourselves and say, okay, so if we're going to read the Torah, this week's chapter, what is this indispensable message to us? And this is what I attempt to do week after week. I always say attempt to do it. I hope somewhat successful. And I said, it is a challenge. But the challenge is not just for me, the challenge is for all of us. Because if Judaism is going to be rendered in any way meaningful or relevant to us and our children, our grandchildren, there is really no other option. It's either indispensable or it's dispensable. Optional basically means dispensable. Maybe not such a harsh word as dispensable, but that's what it means. It means yeah, either yeah or not. And if you have something else more important, that takes priority. So from my point of view, being... Uh, somewhat of an anarchist, meaning an extremist by nature, that's either all or nothing, meaning that. How do you like that approach? In other words, either the message is a true one that's worth to, to die for and live for 
as our parent, grandparents did for thousands of years, or if it's not relevant, let's stop faking ourselves, let's find other things to do instead of wasting our time in pursuing a uh, act of folly. So the challenge, therefore, is to understand the Torah as an indispensable tool. And that is what I've dedicated my life to do, and that's why I'm sitting here, and we always like to begin with point of departure, the purpose of our sitting here, the agenda, as they say, of the meeting, or the mission statement that I've just declared as my mission is to try to unravel or undecipher the Torah and make it an indispensable tool to each of our lives, including mine, including yours. And of course, this includes not generic terms. Each of you are different. Each of us has different needs, different time in our lives, different challenges, different struggles. So the Torah has to not just be a generic uh, statement of platitudes, but one that actually addresses where you are right now, the issues that you are struggling with, the depths of your heart and your soul, whether it's issues of pain or issues of joy. Um, well, we all know we have our, we have our complex psyches. Um, everyone's got their psyche to deal with. If there's someone here that doesn't have a psyche to deal with, uh, you should go home and uh, get yourself a little rest. Uh, and since we have these psyches we, that are part of our lives, this includes, of course, not to, not to fail, not to, not, I don't want to fail to mention our parents and all the positive and uh, sometimes negative um, forces, the voices that haunt us and uh, have shaped our formative, formative years and still remain with us. So without all that being said, the Torah has to address that in a personal way, not just in a gen general and collective fashion. So each week I try to find a theme within the chapters or within the time that we're in, the holiday season, that address some other aspect of life and existence. And the last few weeks I've been talking a lot about um, betraying ourselves, being betrayed by others, betraying yourself, betraying your promised land. It was last week's discussion. The week before was about uh, broken promises and, uh, and um, the, the idea of shattered dreams and how we can regain hope even when things have been lost. Being that this is the week is the chapter of Korach, which continues in a sequence of events that, as I said, happened around exactly 3,319, 18 years ago, when the Jews were traveling through the wilderness on their way out of Egypt, on their way to the Promised Land. So we're smack in the middle of that journey. More specifically, actually, 42 journeys. If you've been following the emails I've been writing, I started a new series a few weeks ago called 42 Journeys, referring to the 42 journeys of every soul in life goes through 42 journeys, as the Baal Shem Tov says. So if you haven't been following, if you leave your email address, you can get those that series. I'm going to continue this week, hopefully, and go on until we finish all those 42 journeys. I've been getting very interesting reactions to those uh, emails. Like one guy writes to me, well... After reading the first 12 journeys, he says, I haven't even begun the first. Now, you have to remember, the first journey is the one out of your mother's womb. So if someone hasn't begun that journey, it's a little sad. Uh, but, so, uh, <laughs> now, what he meant, of course, was that you can be outside of physically out of your mother's womb, but you may still be there. In some ways, it's called not completely severing the umbilical cord. Right? And umbilical cords, as we know, can be very long. Uh, as I said, not just physically, they can extend for a long, long, to your midlife, even to the end of your life. So that's what this guy wrote to me. And I'm getting very interesting comments, so that's great. I wrote back, of course, that, uh, listen, the uh, 42 journeys are not always in that order. Maybe you start with a different journey, and then you'll get back to the one, to the first one. We live in a bizarre world, so journeys sometimes work backwards, frontwards, upside down, right side up, whatever it may be. So right now, we're talking the book of Bamidbar and the fourth book of the Torah, is this essentially focuses very intently on these journeys. It actually began, of course, when the Jews left Egypt, and will conclude with the end of the Bible that we read around Simchas Torah, not around, but on Simchas Torah, when the Jews arrive at the border, River Jordan, on the east bank of the River Jordan, about to enter the Promised Land. And most of the Torah is consumed with this, these journeys. So amidst these journeys, every leg of the journey has its own challenges. Last week the challenge was the scouts who decided, who determined that the land was too difficult to conquer. Promised land, that is. And they essentially libeled the land and caused panic 
and brought destruction to their generation. By them not willing to enter the promised land, God fulfilled their self-defeating uh, request, self-defeating uh, prophecy, which is that they never ended up entering. The week before was another challenge. This week, the technical story goes like this. We'll introduce the character here. In this part of the stage of the game, his name is Korach. So the chapter, the, the chapter of this week's Torah, this week's Torah chapter is called Korach. The name of the individual, he happens to be also a cousin of Moses. So he's a man of royalty. He's a Levite, comes from the, the tribe of Levi. As you may know, that the tribe of Levi were a special tribe, chosen to be the priests and the Levites. They were the ones that served in the temple. The, of course, the high priest was Aaron himself, Aaron, the brother of Moses. Moses was a Levite, and so was Korach. And the story begins by Yikach Korach, which, of course, is a very, a, a, a very, um, the word for, um, by Yikach Korach, that Korach rebelled, mutineered. It's an aggressive stand. He took a stand against Moses and Aaron. And essentially his argument was, amongst different statements he made, was, why did you and your brother, he's telling Moses, take leadership in your own hands? But he, put, but he was a wise man, as Rashi says, he was a very intelligent man, he was an aristocrat, he was a scholar, and it was extremely wealthy as well, which is important to the plot as it develops. Um, so Korach says, Madua tisnasu kola The entire community are sacred, are holy. Madua tisnasu, why did you exalt yourself? Why did you make yourself more special? In essence, Karach is really, you can say, the first, uh, the first uh, socialist. He was essentially saying, why is there a class system? Everybody is equal in the eyes of God. I mean, this, and this is not commentary. This is literal Bible statement. In the, the verse itself, it says, Kala Eda Kadeshimheim. The entire community, the entire nation are holy. Madua Tisnasa. Why did you make yourselves greater? Essentially challenging the whole context of leadership. Moses and Aaron. But as the story is full of its contradictions and paradoxes, then Korach continues that he wants to be a leader. How that consistent with exactly the statement of saying that everyone is holy is interesting. But as he say, he claims he wants to be a leader. And then he says he wants to have many leaders. Anyway, as the story continues, of course, Moses is... Um, very disturbed by this challenge, not because he lacked confidence. He knew that his leadership was not about him, but about God's choice. But the fact is, Korach had good arguments. So Moses, Moses turns to God, and God says to them, let, so let us now demonstrate who is a true, who should be leaders. And the story continues that God offered a test that let everyone bring a rod into the temple, and whoever's uh, rod will bear fruit, almonds actually, that will be a sign from heaven that uh, th that is who God chose. And of course it wasn't Korach that prevailed, but it was the Levites and the Kohanim, the way God had intended. And then of course the story continues, the famous uh, another biblical episode where the earth opens up and consumes Korach, actually not Korach himself, but all those that he, that, that uh, gathered with him and mutineered and rebelled. There are many more details to the story, but that's the essence of it. Now, there are many questions to be asked. As I said, the focus here is not about overanalyzing in depth the biblical interpretations. There are plenty of commentaries. You can read them on your own if you want to understand the meaning of the verses and all the details and so on. And there are commentaries and cross-commentaries and, and arguments and counter-arguments and questions and answers and uh, what I will focus on here, as I said at the outset, is the blueprint aspect. What is, how is this a blueprint for us? Why is this story important for us to know? And what does it teach us about ourselves, about life, about um, leadership, about power, about arrogance, humility? You know, some chapters you have to dig a little deeper to find uh, relevant messages. Here, it's pretty obvious. Korach says it in very contemporary terms. As I, I mentioned the word socialism. If you read Marx, and that is not Groucho, 
but Karl Marx, um, you find a very similar argument. Basically, the strong argument against the idea of a class system, of economic classes, of a lower class, a middle class, an upper class, and that essentially Marxism in its purest form, socialism in its purest form, is the elimination of all privatization, all private property, in order to create an equal play, a level playing field, in the words of Marx, that everyone gets according to their needs and everyone works according to their abilities. Essentially meaning there would be no concept of profit. There'd be no concept of anyone being higher or lower than another. On paper, it sounds like utopia, which explains why it was so attractive to so many people at the time, including many Jews, because it wasn't tested. Now, you have to, of course, there were detractors right at the outset, but the concept sounds great. As a matter of fact, King David asked the question in the Medrash, he says to God, quoting a verse, Li ha-kesev li hazov, Omar nu'um God says, I have all the gold and all the silver. So King David says, if you have all the gold and all the silver, God, why did you allow there to be poor people and rich people? Which creates so much, in, so much um, divisiveness, so much uh, differences bet between us. Give everyone an equal amount. And God's response is also with a verse. Chesed emes man If I gave everyone equally, there would be no chesed in this world. And since I wanted human beings to learn how to give, I had to give some people and I had to take away from others. So there'd be givers, which if you think about it is an amazing answer. Basically God is saying that in truth everyone is equal. And the only reason I bless someone with more wealth is to, because I trust that person, to have the wisdom to understand that it's not theirs. And that all they were blessed with was really a more opportunity to be bigger, greater giver. And of course everyone in this world has something they can give. So what we say in Hebrew, a pekodon. God gives a wealthy person a pekodon, in trust. He gives people money in trust. And the mistake, as the Bible says later, is that you think you're self-made. And you think it's yours. That's the great mistake. That's what God answered King David. So Marx in his own way, or I say lahavdal, not lahavdal, Jewish, not Jewish, whatever. For those that came in late, I'm not talking about Groucho Marx. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Um, also touched upon this point, which, which was touched the court of many people. So Adam Smith and the capitalists of his time advocated wealth of nations, the power of capitalism, that greed is a motivating factor. That if you don't have self-interest involved, people will not be driven to work. They have to feel they're going to profit from their own efforts. But everyone agreed it wasn't a perfect system. It was the way Churchill said it, I think, that democracy is the worst system he's ever found, but he never found a better one. So you could say capitalism is the same thing. He never found a better one. And it's true that the big argument against Marx is, Marx is what will made of, motivate people to work? But the counter-argument is where do you draw the line? Where does greed stop? And we're, and we're facing this issue in corporate America today that with all the regulations, so to speak, with emphasis on so to speak, and with all the laws, we see from the few incidents that, uh, well, few or even more than few, that uh, people are caught, you can imagine how many are not caught and what's going on. It's about, it's a ca game of cat and mouse because greed is a driving force. On the other hand, if you eliminate personal gain, you get into a situation where, um, what's the motivation? And the bottom line is Marxism, for all its virtues on paper, didn't work when it was implemented. It caused more abuse than any capitalist system ever did. If you talk about an individual having power, no one had more power than the ultimate communists who were following so-called Marxism. Because if, you follow, if you're familiar with the Marxist theory, it works something like this. That the goal is that the entire world become communist, essentially. Meaning, as long as there's one person on earth that still has private property, you know, it won't work. Everybody has to be equal. 
but you can't expect that to happen overnight. So there would be required revolution, would be required the, they call it the specter of communism hangs over Europe. But meanwhile, the question was, so who meanwhile holds on to the so-called uh, assets until everybody's equal? Uh, that little question became the biggest issue. So, so officially, communists were, communist leaders were essentially the so-called uh, trustees. However, when you have trustees without accountability, they became, as I said, much worse than any greedy capitalist ever was. Stalin was the ultimate example. So Marxism didn't work. Its theories, some of them still have great virtue. As a matter of fact, much of it has affected even capitalism. Because raw capitalism is not what we have in the United States. Raw capitalism would have no workers' rights. You know, a lot of uh, the unionization, which itself has become its own mafia, it's another story. But the point is, a lot of the laws that protect workers are built on Marx's challenges to capitalism. But here's not the place to go with it in detail. I will say, however, you talk about relevance, read the story of Korach's challenge to Moses, and you have thousands of years before Marx and before Smith and the capitalists and the Marxist arguments, directly in this chapter, direct discussion about this. Since I have discussed this in the past, and I've also written about it, it's not what I want to elaborate on. I just wanted to point out, if you talk about relevance, it doesn't get more relevant. That's exactly what Korach said to Moses. Everybody's equal. Why is there a class system? Why are there leaders? Why are there followers? And so on. If you want to read about this in more detail, I'd be happy to send you. I, I wrote up a whole, I, I once delivered a paper at Cambridge in uh, London on this topic about wealth and spirituality and capitalism versus socialism. What's the Torah's view? Because the Torah does not advocate uh, um, public property, meaning that no private property. The Torah specifically speaks about people owning property. It was only the Levites, actually, and the Kohanim that were not, did not own their own homes and property because they were public servants. So if you want to read about this, feel free to just email my office. I'll send you a few links. We'll send you a few links about this topic. But it's just an interesting how relevant it, may, it, it is to issues, but to, to issues in general, political and economic issues that are very much affect life today. But to take it more to the personal level, which is the key question that Korach has, the personal level. What is the story? What is a leader? And why do we need leaders? If God created us all, and we all have an individual soul, and that soul is sacred, and yes, as the Declaration of Independence states, which comes straight from the Bible, that all people are created equal. The Declaration says men, but in the Torah it says people. So all people are created equal, men and women. Why? Because every human being, by virtue of being created in the divine image, is an indispensable part of existence, endowed with in, in, in unalienable rights by the Creator. This is central Torah thought. If that's the case, what is the role of a leader? And how do we prevent a leader from becoming corrupt? Because if you give someone leadership power, that means that they can lead you and they can, they can control you. And we've seen the corruption of leadership throughout history. Power corrupts, is the cliché. So Korach's challenge to Moses is a big challenge. It's a very powerful challenge. That's why Moses didn't take it lightly. It wasn't Moses just to said to him, listen, God chose me, goodbye. And that's why it's documented, which is above all the most amazing thing of the Torah, is that it documents critique against itself. People don't, aren't aware of this. Go to any other book, holy book. Holy books, they're, meant, they're not meant to criticize themselves, criticize their own leaders. They're meant to deify them. The Torah is the exact opposite. Moses is constantly challenged by the people. So you think of it this way. If you were Moses and you left the book for us all, You'd eliminate all the critique. Why would you leave critique for the generations to come to have to read about it? And why wasn't it censored? If the Torah is a, uh, uh, was controlled, so to speak, as some would say, it should have been censored. If you read the Torah, it is the only religious text that is constantly, every leader does not always come out in the best of light, including Moses. Look at the whole generation that leaves Egypt, dies in the wilderness. Who would write such a book about themselves? The story of Korach. The end of the story is that Moses prevails. 
So why do we need to hear about all the details before that? So if you had a fight in your family, and someone challenged you in the family, and you ended up prevailing, and you were right, would you write in, the, in a diary or a history book the whole story that happened? It happened. That's it. Why, why uh, bring up old wounds? And this isn't an isolated episode. The whole Torah is filled with stories like this. A few weeks ago, you hear Miriam criticizing her brother. Why do that when she was wrong? I mean, why document it all? Because the Torah is a book of reality. It's not here to mince words. This isn't about a popularity contest. It's not about a fairy tale that has a happy ending. As a matter of fact, the Bible ends not so happy. Moses dies. The whole generation dies. Nobody ends up in the promised land. I'd like to see a movie that sells with such an ending. It wouldn't work. It's just it's too sad. Not one person. I mean, you have two people entering Israel, but the Torah doesn't make a big thing about it. At the end, the saddest few sentences that you'll ever read is the end, how Moses goes up on the mountain, and with a kiss of death, God kisses him, and it says in beautiful terms that there was never a man that was, that, that was ever godly as Moses, never a man that was so humble. A man who spoke to God face to face. And yet, with all that, still, he does not enter the promised land, which was what he lived for. It's a pretty sad ending. The answer is because the Torah is not about making us feel good. This isn't some type of like spiritual good feel, feel good book. It's about reality. It's about a relationship with God, and the relationship is not always easy. As a matter of fact, it's probably harder than it is, more times that it's difficult than it is easy. And that's a book that the Jewish people could embrace, and that's a book that they could live through a Holocaust and inquisitions and pogroms. If it was a nice, good, uh, touchy-feely book, it would never empower them to deal with the real challenges of life. So the Torah never uh, purports to be this type of like illusion of heaven, some type of uh, utopian world. It's reality in the cruelest and harshest sense of the word. But at the same time, it's absolute godliness because it's dealing with this, the, the most divine of all experiences and that's the human struggle in life. The Torah, in a sense, sanctifies the struggle itself. And that's also a point that people don't fully understand. You know, we like things that are easy. We like to hear things that make us smile. And there's no problem with that. But life is not all about smiles. Life is dealing with many, many challenges. So it's true, we cry out to God when something bad happens to a good person. And we should cry out. But that doesn't mean that we are broken and destroyed by it. It means that we cry out in pain and we, uh, we demand from a righteous God righteous behavior. As Abraham stated when God was about to destroy the wicked city of Sodom, Abraham says that the world will say that the judge of the entire universe doesn't do justice. And mind you, this is Abraham defending not exactly an innocent city. A wicked city, a cruel city. However, Abraham in his relentless pursuit of uh, goodness could not let God over the hook when he saw destruction, even if it was justified. And you find this paradox all the time. Moses is the same thing. He sees Pharaoh bathing in the blood of Jewish children and he cries out to God, why are you, God, an accusing finger pointed at God, why are you, God, allowing evil to this nation? He could have said, why are you all being silent and allowing the Egyptians to do evil? He could have said, why? Many things, but he accuses God. He doesn't even ignore the Egyptians because he knew that God has the power. So you have the greatest people of men, men and women of faith in the Torah are the greatest challengers of God. Usually you think faith should dictate being a very, uh, um, very quiet, passive recipient of destiny. That's not true at all. Faith is aggressive. Faith is challenging. Have faith is anything but passive. Faith is an absolute belief and commitment to goodness. And when you don't see it, you cry out. If you don't cry out, that's not faith. That's called cowardice. So faith is about courage. Faith is about wisdom. It's a myth that people think faith is this type of like absence of logic. You have no logic, so you're left with nothing but faith. True people of faith know it's the exact opposite. It's after all the logic... And that hasn't worked. You come to a door that's beyond logic, and that's called faith. So a little child, a two-year-old says, I don't know. That's the faith of a little child. 
That's not real faith. But a faith of an 80-year-old sage like a Moses standing before God and says, I don't understand you, that's not the same, I don't know. That's a different level of uh, uh, faith. That's a faith that follows reason, not precedes reason. So with that being said, you have your story of Korach, bluntly told by Moses who had controlled what it said in the Torah, because it's important for us to know the story, it's important for us to know the challenge, and it's important to know that what Korach said, no matter what, how difficult it was to hear it, is documented for posterity. And even though every year we read that Korach was wrong, we still read it again and again, like that story where the child, the first time he went to school, so he read in Chumash, you know, the story with Joseph. Jacob sends Joseph to go find his brothers. So he goes to the field, and the brothers see him alone there, and that's when they kidnap him, and they almost kill him, and then sell him into slavery. So the next, next year, when the child is learning Chumash, they come to that chapter, and he sees that his father is sending Joseph. So he yells out in the classroom, he says to his teacher, he doesn't understand. Doesn't he remember what happened last year when his father sent him to the field? Why is he going now again? They're going to again... They're, because he understood and read the story as if it's happening now. So we already read the Korach story. Yet every year we read it again, and we read it with all its negative elements, because the question that Korach asked is a very legitimate one. It's a Torah question, or else the Torah wouldn't put it into the Torah. There are many questions you can imagine, and many um, re re rebels, and many challenges that we don't even know about that happened those years in the wilderness. The fact that some are selected is because it's important to understand this question. So essentially what Karach is saying is all the nation are, are sacred and holy. Why are you leaders? Why do we need leaders for that matter? It's a very important question. Especially, as I said, leadership can corrupt. Power corrupts. I don't need to prove it. You look around, that's what happens. Give people power, especially if there's no accountability, it corrupts. So basically you can really rephrase Korach's question and saying, how do we know, Moses, that you won't corrupt your power? Even if till now you've done everything right, you can extend the question a little further. Even if you never corrupted, how do we know your, your, um, um, uh, or your successors won't corrupt it? Very good. <laughs> we get audience participation here. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying it as a, I always, every year, every week I have to plug the reasons to come here. I know there's some people listening in New Zealand and in other places. I know you can't just make it here that uh, quickly. But uh, there are uh, virtues of sitting in, uh, here in the live in the class. Okay? Uh, that was a station identification. Uh, to know that we are real. <laughs> this isn't virtual. Yes. Um, so... So the question extends to the successors. Even if you, Moses, are a man of God, and it's hard to imagine that Carl did not know that. As I said, he wasn't a simple person. He wasn't a slouch. He was a uh, wise man. He was a Levite. He had just seen, just the last, the last few years, that it was Moses that led the Jews out of Egypt, that brought the Torah down from Sinai. It was very clear that part of the sea, it was hard for anyone to ignore so when he's saying this to Moses, it's, it's, it, would be very, it would be ridiculous to try to interpret that he was suspecting Moses of suddenly being corrupt. But he was stating something that was much more broader than that. Leadership corrupts. And when you establish precedent of being leaders, one day, maybe in the 20th century or the 19th century, there will be rabbis and leaders who will use their position to be abusive. So he's challenging the whole premise of leadership. So you see how this question, if you just read it a little broader than just an immediate moment, is a very vital question. I don't know if you've ever asked this question of your rabbis, but this is the question of Korach. Now I should, I should add, some people dismiss Korach as being just a simple guy, but it was the Shpola Zayda, one of the holy tzaddikim of the times a little after the Baal Shem Tov, that once said, the Helik is Zayda Korach, he called it. My holy grandfather Korach. So Korach was not a uh, simple person. So his argument really is one that resonates today. I remember a few years ago at this class, which is when I first began discussing this topic, a, uh, there was someone that came to see me after the class and asked me this question. They said they are, began their so-called Jewish journey and started going to synagogues around New York. 
I will not mention names, so there will be protection of the innocent and also protection of the non-innocent. Well, that's not what I want to do, but let's put it this way. I don't want to be, uh, you know, it's not a court here, so I'm not putting anyone on a trial. And he said to me, sadly, something that I heard from hundreds of people before and after, but that was poignant because it was the week of Korach, so I decided I'm going to just address it then. He said to me that uh, he, uh, a few years earlier, began, so as I said, his Jewish journey. He went to Israel, stayed for a month in the summer, went to school here, school there. We all know the story. I mean, similar stories. Then he came back to New York, and he began looking for a synagogue. So, in his own naivete, using his words, he just was looking. He thought everybody's pure. Bunch of tzaddikim, and he unfortunately lived a life where he wasn't with the world of tzaddikim. Tzaddikim are the ultra righteous, and uh, so he went in with that attitude. Went synagogue to synagogue. Just a question: Which tzaddik is he going to choose? And he found out <laughs> that it wasn't exactly the way that way. First, he heard from one tzaddik, told him that the other tzaddik is a uh, an animal. I, I, I say the word tzaddik, of course, quote unquote, uh, but that was his words. And then he went to the second one, and they told him even worse about the first one. So he says, wow, these are very holy people. They're so holy, they just can't, you know. Uh, but he was not a, he's not a stupid guy. But he, so slowly he learned that this is not a simple matter. How do you find a rabbi or a teacher? And then, of course, happened what happens to so many. He was hurt by a few, and he thought that they were, like, really pure and so on. He realized that everybody's got their egos, and this one's petty. And this one's narrow-minded, and this one only cares about his money, and this one has other agendas, and some were outright abusive. I'm not saying it was all a nightmare. He says he did find some good people, but he was very disappointed. And ultimately, he just went back to his life simply because he could not find a community that he could join. Now, I'm not justifying him. I'm sure he has his own stuff and his own issues. It was just I'm using this as an example because I remember it was the week before Korach when he came to speak to me. And then I was reading Karach, and I realized, and I called him, I told him, I said, you know, our holy grandfather Karach anticipated your issues, and he questioned this to Moses thousands of years ago. Maybe he meant you. You know, maybe he meant that you were one day going to be navigating around these synagogues in the Upper East West Side and Upper East Side and the whole New York scene, and you're going to encounter uh, so-called uh, rabbis and leaders. And the question is, what do we need them for? If everybody is holy, what do we need them for? And it's true, there are quite a few people who call themselves leaders we actually don't need. Which I, obviously, this is of course what Korach's statement is saying. So, the fact that the Torah continues and, and Moses does prevail as being the leader, meaning God did choose him, this doesn't mean that every leader is a leader. Let's make sure that's right. You know, in other words, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean no one wants to get me. Just because um, uh, Moses is demonstrated to be a leader doesn't mean Korach's question isn't legitimate. The question is, how do you determine who is a leader, who's not a leader? So question number one on the table here is, what is the answer to Korach's question? If everybody is holy, why do we need leaders? And the second, of course, subset of that question is, the fact is, power corrupts, and when people are leaders, how do you know that they will not hurt others <coughs> in that position? And this isn't a theoretical question. We've seen it again and again and again. And I'll make the question even more relevant. Not just for the Jewish world. The Jewish world is definitely legitimate. But you could say very much modern times is shaped by this question of Korach's. And I'll tell, explain how. The enlightenment of the 17th, 18th century, 19th century, one of its fundamental principles it's based on was basically emancipation from religious oppression. That's why it became such a war of science versus religion reason versus faith. And the argument was, of the intellectuals and the thinkers of the Enlightenment, was enough is enough. A thousand, two thousand years the church has oppressed us, has told us what we could think, what we can't think. Galileo, of course, is the ultimate example. He was forced to recant his conclusion scientific observations because it went against church doctrine. Enough is enough. We will now, reason shall prevail. So today, we know that the enlightenment, may have gone, the enlightenment may have gone too far to the other extreme, that there's altogether no accountability. But regardless, their argument was a very correct one. Leadership corrupts. We've seen it. The monarchs, the church leaders. This was corruption. This was power. 
It was a control game. And up till the, basically the first millennium, till essentially the 12th, 13th, I would say the 14th, 15th century, individuality was not something that was even considered to be a virtue. I don't know if you know this. I remember when the New York Times did a special issue on the new millennium, the, second, the, 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 the year 2000, the second millennium. So there's a whole, it was called, I think, uh, the me millennium or something like that. Me millennium. Huh? Right. Me millennium. Right. And basically, they, they, it was a very fascinating issue. They, exp they showed how the first millennium, the me, the individual, was not considered a big thing. As a matter of fact, it was considered a vice. To the point, living collectively, not only your own family, with a group, living in a, in a, in a homes were built around ag the agrarian agricultural society, and it was not about, live, private space was not considered a quality, a virtue. Private property, private space, your space, my space, you know, Facebook. That was not, that was not, uh, wasn't, not only was it not existent, it wasn't even something that was aspired to. I wasn't around in those days. It's hard to imagine, you know, today, with the fierce individuality and dependence that we have, it's hard to imagine how millions of people just follow that approach. I must tell you that the Jews definitely did not. And they were in a way protected, being so-called discriminated against and forced into ghettos and forced to be Jewish actually made them much more fiercely independent because they never had to conform. They, didn't even, they weren't even able to conform if they wanted to. Today we have that problem. So the Jews were extremely, it was like the exact opposite. Everything was independence. <clears throat> so bottom line is, Korach's argument, why leaders and leaders can corrupt, history in the last few thousand years is a, the proof is in the pudding, and very much democracy today, freedom today, is, it was an outcry and a rebellion, no different than Korach's rebellion. However, of course, Korach was wrong in his particular instance with Moses. But his argument per se is not wrong. That's why it's documented. So Korach's argument, in an interesting way, was meant to be like almost a preemptive immunity system that in every generation we have a Korach to ask the question, why do you need leadership? How do we know this leadership is pure and healthy? So Korach's question also becomes part of the story. And just in case you're missing what I'm saying, I'll just reiterate it. Not just that, it's not that many of us read the story Korach was wrong, Moses is the leader, Korach was a rebel, and story over. If that's the case, we wouldn't read it every year again, it wouldn't become part of Torah. Korach's argument is an argument that must be in every healthy dialogue. In other words, when there's a leader in a community, whether it's a rabbi or whatever you call this leader, there should always be a Korach that rebels. How do you like that? Now what I mean by that is, doesn't mean out of, with disrespect necessarily, or in any unhealthy ways, because we're going to discuss Korach had his issues too, he wasn't a perfect guy either. But the idea of challenging leadership is not an unhealthy thing. I know many rabbis will not like what I'm saying. And that's why, if you're a rabbi listening to this, uh, please uh, listen to the end of the story, so uh, <laughs> don't just uh, change the channel. Um, right? Because there's another side to this. I'm not, God forbid, suggesting that when you're in school and you have a teacher, or a parent for that matter, or a, uh, or a leadership authority, that we should just be Korach and just rebel, period, and that's it. That, of course, can lead to anarchy, and then altogether you have no uh, standards. So the issue of respect is not what we're just talking about here. However, in order to have checks and balances against abuse of power, we have in Torah and Judaism a concept called Mehechen Dantuni, which means that every one of us has a right to ask someone, an authority, who's, let's say, passed a legal ruling, where did you derive your ruling from? And that person is obligated, that authority, to show us their sources, which is why you find when people go to what's called a Din Torah, a Din Torah is a, essentially a rabbinic court. So Jews who follow rabbinic law, if they have a dispute between themselves, they usually will not go to secular courts, they'll go to a rabbinic court. There's plenty of controversy around that, there's anyone you can trust, etc. But let's just for argument's sake say two Jews, they want to go to a rabbinic court. 
The rabbinic court will sit, let's say three people will sit in, 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 uh, like, like judges. They'll hear all the arguments back and forth. It works very much like in the courtroom. And then they will rule. After they hear both sides equally, everyone has equal time, everyone has fair representation, etc., etc. This is a system of Torah law that goes back thousands of years, long before we had a United States Constitution that essentially emulates um, biblical law. This is how biblical law works. And consensus, two out of three. A bezdin, a court, will always be an odd number. It could be three, it could be nine, it could be seven, it could be 71, which would be a full Sanhedrin. Always odd, so there's never a, a hung so-called jury. You always have a majority. And there's a lot of fascinating laws around this. I just want to share one, which is a complete tangent, but it just comes to mind. I think it's important to know how uh, sophisticated Torah law is. And this goes back literally thousands of years. If, for instance, the court of 71, and these are considered 71 objective scholars. If they're not objective, they have to recuse themselves and pull themselves out of the court. So 71 people sitting in judgment of an issue that has capital punishment possible capital punishment consequences. Meaning it's a serious crime, murder or something like that. Uh, <coughs> here's a law in the Torah. That do, uh, if you don't know this, it will blow you away. It says like this, that of course, they, they have to hear everything, fair arguments, everyone has a right to defense, and uh, there's no such thing as, as hearing a testimony without the other party hearing it. You know, all these modern so-called constitutional law approaches Every the accuser has to see the accused, etc., etc. Now, so 71 sitting in judgment. So you could have 35 and 36, hypothetically. So of course you follow the 36, or you could have a larger majority. Now, of course, it, it, it would seem that, especially if it's capital punishment, the greater the majority, the better it is. 36, 35, you're going to hang someone uh, based on uh, one vote. Yet, but there is a consensus. So here's a law in the Torah that says that if there's an, a unanimous decision and 71 people vote that the person is guilty, the person is acquitted. And the Torah's right reasoning for it is because it's impossible that 71 people, not one, could have found some type of virtue. It has to be something something's weird. That's how far the Torah will go from not allowing a person to be executed. Now, this is, if you think about it, it's unbelievable uh, um, compassion, but more importantly, it's an un, 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 think unanimous. It doesn't get better than that. The unanimous, from the Torah point of view, is suspicious. That's the strict guidelines and the accountability that the great leaders were subject to. So let's go back to what I was saying. And this is, a, I've used this many times, People ask me, how do I find a true rabbi, a true leader? So I built, developed this small litmus test that's, uh, uh, what's, what's it called? Um, uh, uh, error proof. What's that? No, no, no. I don't say infallible, that's too strong of a word. It's uh, um, foolproof. Foolproof, oh, that's the word. Good, good, good. <laughs> foolproof. Not because I thought of it, but because you'll see in a moment. If you hear a rabbi or a teacher or a leader say something that sounds a little strange to you, ask them respectfully, where are their sources of what they just said? And you'll have three responses, three possible responses. One response is this. The person, the rabbi or teacher, will look at you, either with words or with body language, with a type of disdain and condescension. Like, who the hell are you to question me? <laughs> Have anybody here ever experienced something like that? <laughs> yes or no? The laugh is very... Uh, what about it on the web? Let me know. Um, you have experienced it, really? Okay, good. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. Um, did anybody experience it from me? Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be not, uh, not good. Um, so that's one type of response. Some rabbis will be, will be overtly derisive, meaning, and I've seen this actually, unfortunately, will be dismissive, will be um, uh, cynical, 
Well, like, you know, who are you, who are you, who do you think you are? To, you know, I'm the big rabbi scholar. The second possible answer, response to the question, where are my sources, would be, I don't really have any. I thought of it in the shower this morning. I don't know if anyone's was going to say that. Um, or it's my inspiration, my, my own idea. That's response, possible response number two. And the third response, which unfortunately you'll hear less of, but is the only one that's legitimate from a Torah point of view, is the person, the teacher and the rabbi, will humbly tell you their sources. How do you like that? They actually will answer your question. And they'll tell you, here are my sources. I take it from the Bible or from the Talmud or from the Zohar. Here's the verse. Here's how I interpreted it. In other words, they will expose their sources. They'll let you retrace the steps. Which we know today, of course, is critical in any type of scientific theory and experiment. It has to be replicated. Someone comes up with a great experiment. They say they're, they're the only ones that can come up with that result and no one else can figure out how to do it in the lab. It's quite suspicious, especially when they have something to gain. So the Torah says, states clearly that a, per, a true rabbi teacher will show you their sources and show you how they interpret it and let you look at it. What is that? What is really the difference between the three? It's called humility. Since when are leaders and rabbis exempt of humility? As a matter of fact, in the Talmud it says that the reason Hillel, you know, Hillel and Shammai were the classic debaters. They argued by many different laws. Hillel usually was more lenient. Shammai was usually more stringent, more strict. Except in a few, exce a few exceptions. And the Talmud concludes that they argued for, for a period of time. And then, finally, the ruling was, according to the consensus was, we go according to Hillel. And the Talmud tells an interesting reason. Because Hillel was the humble one. Now, humility is a great virtue. We all know that. But how is that a determining factor in deciding who you rule according to in a legal case? If the Talmud said Hillel was the wiser one, was the greater scholar, presented better arguments, was a better um, analyst, etc., etc., that would make sense. You're talking about a legal ruling here. We're not giving points out for humility. We're giving out points for someone who knows how to derive from the Torah a legal ruling. So you need someone with a good mind, good arguments, sound, 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 uh, uh, sound proofs, and so on. The answer is because in the pursuit of truth, what's more important than scholarship and knowledge and book smart is humility. Because without humility, you can't trust the source. Because someone may be a great scholar, but their arrogance or their subjectivity may cloud their judgment. Hillel, when he presented an argument, he would first present Shammai's argument first in full glory, which no one does. Why would you first you present your argument and then you add as a footnote and... Just for the record, there's someone else has another opinion. You know, you don't want to dismiss it completely. Some people won't even add that either, but he resented Shammai's arguments in full glory, with the full arguments and strength, and then he presented his own. So Tom, oh, that's the case. He's humble enough. We can trust. We can trust that he will be able to say, I have a weak argument here. You know, I'm not sure. I don't know what to say in this instance. That's who you want to rule. The only virtue you find in the Torah of Moses was humility that, I mean Moses had many qualities. He was a Talmud Chacham he was a scholar. He was a Baal Chesed, kind I mean, you see instances of it all over sensitive as a shepherd to the people's needs but the, the verse states Moshe Ya'anov and Moses was the humblest man that ever walked on earth that's a statement that's made just read, read, read it two weeks ago because above all, leader in Torah is humility. Without humility, you don't have the ability to really know whether this is a godly person. So Korach's grave error, and that's why he was, a, it was considered a, ma a major sin for which he was deeply punished, was not his question. His question is a legitimate question. However, to his misfortune, he asked the question of the wrong person. We should have Korach coming around today and challenging rabbi. That would have been very nice. But he chose the wrong guy. <laughs> he chose Moses. You know, 
and he chose a man that God did choose, and he chose a man that was the humblest, which is proven time and again. And it's seen in the story itself. Korach, even in his argument that everybody's equal, made it very clear that he wants to be a leader. Almost like saying, you know, you can't trust him, but you could trust me. And we all know what that means. So Korach's power and his wisdom did corrupt him. So he's a model of a brilliant guy with many virtues, but ultimately, because he did not respect the humility of Moses, that was his own undoing. So let's go back to what, what, so what is the answer to the question? And you hear, here's the, I think it's one of the most brilliant insights. This is taken from the Tzamech Tzedek and from different Hasidic writings in explaining why do we need a leader? Because that, that question I still didn't answer. Why do we need a leader? I explained how you can trust a leader if he's humble. But the question still remains. If everybody's holy, what do we need leaders for in the first place? So we shouldn't have any problems. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't have the potential abuse. If there's no leadership, there's no abuse, and that's it. So Karl's question is a very legitimate one. The answer is a very basic one, almost simple, but also extremely profound. And the answer, I'll, tell it, I'll explain it with a story. It's a story from Tanakh. When, King, when uh, Samuel, the prophet, in his times, it was, was yet before the time that the Jews had a king. As you'll see from the story, this is how the King Saul came to be. So the story goes, the Jewish people came to Samuel and said, please appoint for us a uh, king, a leader. And Samuel mm -hmm. got very upset. And he said to the people, God is your king, what do you need another king? What do you need a human king for? And they said, well, other nations have a king, we also want a king. Anyway, they were insistent. So God turned to, to I'm sorry, Samuel turned to God and said, what do I do? So God said, give them a king. They want a king, make, appoint a king. And that's when Samuel anointed King Saul, who himself would not end up being the final king, and after that would become King David. But from then on became the kings. The question that Samach Tzedek asks is this. There's a mitzvah in the Torah, some tasim alecha melech, you shall appoint for yourself a king. So when the people came and asked for a king, they, all, all they were doing was asking to perform a mitzvah. So why was Samuel upset? Why did he need permission from God? The answer is because he recognized that the Jewish people were not interested in a king because the Torah says so. They were interested in a king for egoistic reasons, for nationalistic reasons. Other nations have a king. They wanted to be proud. It was like a symbol thing. It was a vanity thing. The king the Torah is talking about is the king of humility. That's not what they were looking for. They didn't want a humble person. They wanted someone that's going to show off, that's going to demonstrate power. And he explains in a Kabbalistic and a little Hasidic language that Melech, those of you familiar a little with Kabbalah, know that there's ten spheres, right? Everybody knows about the ten spheres? Yes or no? Yes. How much do you know is the question? Okay. Ten spheres. So it goes that basically the ten spheres is like the building blocks of existence and also the ten faculties that all of us have. I'll just ex explain them briefly. That each, each of us is made up of ten faculties, which means um, three intellectual faculties, Chach, Mabin, Das. We understand, we, we uh, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Or conception, comprehension, and conclusion. And then seven emotional faculties, which is, if you're familiar with the Omer book I've done, addresses that in detail. What are the seven emotional faculties? Love, chesed. Second is gvura, discipline. The third is compassion, teferet. The fourth is endurance, netzach. The fifth is humility, haid. And the sixth is yisad, bonding. And the seventh is malchus, melech, kingship or majesty, and dignity. So I want to address the tenth one. David HaMelech, king, what is a king? So when the Kabbalah explains the tenth sphere, it explains the tenth sphere is completely different than all others. Every faculty that we have, for example, how do you define it? By what it manifests in. Chachma is the spark of an idea. 
has manifest as a spark, like you get an idea, a flash. Bina manifests in comprehending the idea, developing it, fleshing it out. Das is the conclusion of the idea, when you say, aha, I got it. And the same with others. Chesed, love, is a manifestation. You love someone. You reach out to them, you extend yourself. Gvura is the antithesis, is discipline and withdrawing. It's another manifestation. Teferis, compassion. Every one of them is defined by what it is. Malchus, listen to this, Malchus is defined by what it's not. The way the Zohar puts it, Malchus is like the moon. Lesla megamaklum. It has nothing of its own. The moon has no light of its own. All its light is a reflection of the sun. But therein lies its power. Its nothingness makes it greater than all the somethingness of the other nine. It is the principle of ultimate humility. Ultimate bittal is the maybe even more correct word. You've heard the word bittal. I've used it many times in this class. In the English, uh, spelling would be B-I-T-T-U-L. But it's quite difficult to translate into English, perhaps because the secular language doesn't tolerate this concept. What is bittal? Bittal is a combination of modesty, humility, and maybe above all, suspension of self. It's the single most critical ingredient in any true experience. Love, there has to be a suspension of self. Growth, you have to shed one layer of skin to assume another layer of skin. We all go through the awkwardness, awkwardness of adolescence. Uh, a seed has to rot in the ground before it grows into a beautiful sapling, tree. A mother goes through birth pains to give birth to a beautiful child. Show me an act of beauty and you'll see always preceding it is an act of a vacuum, a void. The Kabbalists like to put it as a yesh, an, a, a, a entity, an ayin, an emptiness, and then it leads you to another yesh, to a greater being. In other words, to emerge to be a great being, you have to go through a state of, you can call it a void, a vacuum, emptiness, uh, knowing that you don't know. There's a classic uh, statement they make that when you come to a guru, the first time he asks you to bring him a cup of water, like this. And uh, so you think, okay, it's like an act of servitude, so to speak. That you're, you're accepting this teacher as your teacher. It's a symbol. And the guru takes it, and I'm not going to do it here because it won't be appropriate, and he spills the whole thing out. So you think he's like one is insulting you. And then he says, so come back to me when you're like this. In other words, not a full cup. It's the first lesson of all lessons, and that is that you can't learn anything if you think you know everything. So it's not like the doctor who tells you, I'll tell you when you need, when I, when you need a second opinion. That's not what we're talking about. Like the, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when I need humility type of thing. It's the acknowledgement that if you think you have it all figured out, you cannot receive anything new. The Talmud puts it this way, I did the Torah, l'mivla le'polit. When you're busy absorbing, you can't be giving. When you're busy giving, you can't be absorbing. If you are, have a perspective on something, very difficult for you to gonna hear another perspective. Yeah, you may hear details that will uh, so-called confirm your perspective. You may even hear a new thought here and there, but there's no room because you have it all figured out. That's why you'll see any one of you writes or if you're involved in any type of creative endeavor, if you don't have a state of confusion before your conclusion, you, you are not getting anywhere really. There is no such thing as excellence without confusion. And the greater the result, the more confusion that, it's, that, 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 that precedes it. Now why? We all hate it, and I can tell you for myself, as a writer, teacher, one of the hardest things, but you learn that's the process. Why is that the process? Why do you need to go through that? Because if you think you're, if you're filled with your own way of looking at it, you can never grow, you can never go anywhere else. That's your perspective and that's it. You have to, the confusion essentially shakes you out of your past trap and allows you into something new. 
But at the same time, it's the single most uncomfortable thing. Nobody likes to go there. Which is why most people don't achieve excellence. Their fear, their insecurity, their not wanting to see it through, not wanting to go through that confused or vacuum state, doesn't let them get to the greatest places. I've seen this many times. It's sad. We become our own worst enemy. I think I shared this more than once here. I remember when I was a kid. <clears throat> That's not the story that I remember when I was a kid. It's the story behind it. I remember when I was, uh, I don't know, seven years old, eight years old. And it was in the summer. Go away in the summer. We used to go to the country and later summer camp. So I learned to swim. I was a pretty good swimmer. But I remember diving was my new challenge when I was like eight or nine. I don't remember what exact age. And I, re I recall very vividly how I spent summers standing poised at the edge of a pool and just terrified to dive in. And this wasn't one summer. I remember you know, the first day of the summer I got to the pool. Swimming was not a problem, but got to diving, I was terrified. You would count one, two, three to ten and another 10, and one day passed, and the end of nine weeks, you're still counting to 10. And another summer passed, and I couldn't figure I mean, now in retrospect, I was wondering, what was it? I mean, if you don't know how to swim, okay, you're afraid of water. But I knew how to swim. I was not afraid of water. So what is it? I'm standing here. The worst thing is, you got this belly flop. What do you think? Is your belly's going to rip open? Okay, they tell you don't dive after a meal for that reason. I don't know. Um, so how did I finally learn how to dive? So the next trick was you sit at the edge of the pool. You're not jumping fully in. You, know, you sit at the edge and you do that. And that was also too scary for me. So finally I had a friend who actually was a real friend. And he decided enough is enough. He saw me sitting there. He went and pushed me in. <laughs> not knowing. And I learned how to dive. So once I did it, I did it again and again. And that was it. Then I couldn't stop diving. I just was diving all the time. And, of course, at the time I yelled at him, but the, he's the one that opened up. So I've always been thinking over the years, what was it? What is this fear? I only speak for myself. Maybe none of you have ever experienced this, so it's my own weird stuff. And I came to a conclusion based on this Kabbalistic concept. Kabbalah helped me understand my fear <laughs> as a kid of diving. And that is, you can swim, you know how to swim, so that's while you're in the water. You know how to stand on the ground, you're also secure with but that split second, when you're not on the ground and you're not in the water, is terrifying. Because you know, what, where are you? It's only a split second. Of course, logic tells you you're going to be in the water in a moment. But it's something that you cannot see. And we are always terrified of the things that we don't have control over. That's my theory. And it was confirmed, and I heard a story from a Hasid who was, was arrested in Siberia. And he, uh, to keep himself sane, he would constantly talk to other people there and learn lessons from their lives. Many professionals, because the communist Soviets loved to arrest professionals and put them into insane asylums and stuff like that. So they put them in this place. So he had all kinds of professionals. And once a year, or several times a year, they would do like a type of, I guess, carnival circus, you know, whatever talents. And there was a few people from a the circus there, and one person was a tightrope walker. So he began, he got into a conversation with a tightrope walker. And the tightrope, and he started saying, what's the secret of tightrope walking? So you'd think the answer is balance, right? Balance, balancing yourself on a tightrope and managing. Tightrope walker said, no, the secret, the trick of tightrope walking that you have to master is focus. Not on the string, not on the rope, but on the, a destination that's not shaky, that's stationary across where your, your destination is. You have to keep your eyes on it all the time. And the, the focus of walking a straight line to it is the key. The balance comes second. The key, that's the thing that holds you s steady. So then he asked the rabbi, the chassid, he said to him, so tell me, what do you think is the hardest part of tightrope walking? What is the hardest part? So everyone would say right in the middle. Because you're not close to the edges, it's scary, you could fall, etc. He says, no, the hardest part is when, at the end, when you're about to make a turn. Because when you make a turn, you have to create a new stationary destination that's on the other side. And, till, and that split second that you have to shift focus is when you usually will fall. That's what he said. Interesting. In other words, it's about uh, the focus. 
toward a destination. And it's when you lose that, that's where life gets scary. So the relevance to our discussion here is that Bittel is the key, Malchus is the key to leadership. And that's what Samuel did not see in the people. That's not what they wanted. And that's what King Saul ultimately did not end up being. He was too much about himself. And it was King David who ended up being the true king. Karach, his question was correct. Someone that doesn't have that humility doesn't deserve to be a leader. And this answers the question why we need leaders. We need leaders, you know why? Because we don't have selflessness in the side of ourselves. We need role models that are humble, that can serve as an example of how one becomes a godly person. So the interesting thing about a leader is that a leader is not about a motivator, the one that's most charismatic, the one that's climbed the corporate ladder or the, the political ladder to leadership. It's the one that's the humblest, and because of his humility, he's not in the way when he teaches you truth. So you can learn to find your own truth. So what would we be like without leaders? We'd be ego-driven human beings. Self-interest would be the dominating factor. And we wouldn't have an example of how someone could be selfless. So Korach was right. The entire nation are holy. Everybody's holy. We all got holy souls. The thing is the souls are however trapped inside of a body. And the body has other interests. So essentially we're all equal. Everybody's equal in the eyes of God. But on a revealed level, on a conscious level, we need that type of inspiration. We need that type of direction. How do you get beyond your own narrow self-interest to a life of service, of giving? And that's where a leader comes into play. So Karl's conclusion was wrong. He was suggesting leadership is about power. I also want power. He was neglecting to forget what, what God tells Moses on the mountain. When Moses is on the mountain and the people are building a golden calf down below, you know what God says to Moses? Lech raid, descend, go and descend down below. So Rashi, the commentary asks, what's the descending? Of course, he's on the mountain. He knows he has to descend. Where is he going to go? Where else can he go? Now he was telling him, you can't stay here exalted in heaven with me studying Torah when your people are in need. Your people are, have a problem. So it could be because, and he goes on, he says, because all the greatness I've given you is only for them. So by you staying here, you have to go down where they are. That's a leader. The captain of the ship is with the ship, not with the... Is not, greatness. It's greatness for them, not for you. Only the true leaders who understand that can be leaders. I mentioned earlier about the concept of charity in Judaism. That God never really gave anybody wealth for themselves. He gave it so you should be wise enough to give it to others. Obviously most people are not that wise. But the Torah warns us of the, of the challenge where a person says, I am self-made. I I'm the one that earned all of this. Whereas the true blessed person knows that I was given a gift, it was meant to be given to others. Those are the rarer human beings, but those are the people you, can, you, you look for in leaders. That's what a leader is. The person that has that deserves to be a leader. So if you're talking about now finding leaders today, well, good luck. Um, <laughs> if you can, please point it out to me. I will say the following. There are many good people out there. And there are many rabbis and good teachers and rabbis. And they mean well. Some maybe lack knowledge. Some may lack intentions. And yes, some are simply ignorant of what a leader is. I'm not here to put myself on a pedestal. I suggest that I'm the one that's the judge. I'm in the same boat as everyone else. And we all are subject to the same criteria. So if you were going to ask me my sources, um, I'm going to have to deliver them to you. So, but I will say, however, that in a time like ours where there is plenty of corruption and plenty of ignorance, and I will tell you right now, many people who think that they're community leaders or organizational leaders, their mistake is not malicious. The problem is that the leaders that they learn from were not leaders either, so they think that's a leader. It's like having the wrong role model. So you think that's what a leader is. Most rabbis today are probably more administrators, fundraisers, um, I don't want to use derogatory terminology, so let's put it this way. They're good at, uh, they're people people. You know, the expression being a people person. They rub shoulders well. 
I will tell you, that's not definition of leaders. Those are definition of maybe good people. Maybe they can get things done, good chief executives. A leader is the humblest. A leader is a godly person. A true rabbi is a soul doctor. That's what a rabbi is. A person who can speak about souls because he is someone who's sensitive to souls because he's not in the way. Many people don't even expect. I once told this to a rabbi. He said to me, what are you kidding me? No rabbi is like that. I said, well, Moses was like that. Oh, you're going to Moses? Okay. So I said, I understand. I mean, uh, we don't have to be like Moses exactly, but that should be the standard. And if you're not like that, maybe you shouldn't be going in the rabbinate. Maybe you should choose a different job. Just to say no one is that way doesn't mean that you should be that. Uh, that's not like a justification. There is a standard. I can't see how a person who goes into the world of trying to help souls has, it doesn't have humility, shouldn't be in that business. It's just not appropriate. Go to a different business. There are other options. Again, I'm not here to sit in judgment. I'm not mentioning names. And I'm not uh, going in a personalized way. I will, however, say that we are all in the same boat. And as grassroots, we have, we're entitled. And we're, we are, um, let's put it this way, we deserve to have better than what we have. But they also say, in the Talmud it says, that a leader is sometimes commensurate to the generation. You get what you deserve, basically. So if we have leaders like that, we have to look at ourselves and say, why is that our standard, that that's what we accept? So when we will stop tolerating certain things, and we have every, every synagogue has power, because a synagogue is only as powerful as its constituents. I'm not here suggesting to become a rabble-rouser, that there should be Karach rebellions in every synagogue in the East Coast, I don't even know if I have the power to do that anyway. That would be a little uh, presumptuous. But I just want to say for the record, that's not my intention, even if that should happen. Because I also know, and we all know, that there is a requirement of protocol. You have to, we cannot have a situation where there's complete anarchy. And uh, we need to have role models. But when a push comes to shove, I think it's vital that we not be ignorant and we know that there are standards and we can demand them. This type of silencing and saying, no, only the leaders know the secrets. And anyone asking any questions is silenced. To me, is unhealthy in an environment. If the leaders were living up to their title, and we were living in a pure world, yes, we had Moses all over the place, then Korach is wrong. But if the system is not working, and you have 80% assimilation, and 50% intermarriage, and 10% of Jewish children in New York go to Jewish school, then to me, to be silent and say the leadership is working, it's not working. It's absolutely bankrupt. And if it's so bankrupt, what's wrong with a little more challenge? That's how you challenge bankruptcy, by, by uh, not accepting the status quo. So in that sense, I absolutely believe that we can learn from Korach, not his conclusions, not his style, and not his method, but the question itself, that yes, we are all holy people. And any rabbi that thinks he's holier than someone else, and has that condescending attitude, is, is, is doesn't deserve to be in that position. We are all souls. However, we need uh, leaders to help us grow, to help us elevate. So finally, if you can't find a leader, what do you do? Firstly, I would say you look further and you will find one. It may not be in the full body sense of it. It may be somewhat. It may be a combination of different people. There are, it may not be a person who even calls himself a leader. Maybe just someone that uh, you can speak to, that for you works as an authority, that you can run by, you can trust, you can uh, get an objective opinion, and that you subject yourself and you accept that person's opinion because you trust them and you see there's no maliciousness. I have no doubt that everybody can find someone. As I say, it may not be someone that's a pulpit rabbi, but it could be someone that takes on a different shape or form. And secondly, we also have each other as friends. There's a seil acharav, appoint for yourself a teacher, and kneil lechachover, acquire for yourself a friend. Which means that we're able to also find something amongst each other that will help get out of the subjectivity of our lives. And I am a firm believer that if we empower ourselves and we are empowered, we can demand more and, we, and, and the landscape can change. Because it's what we expect, that's what will come back to us in return. You expect less, you're going to get less. And then finally I want to say 
that we also all have inside of ourselves, just like we may have a Korach inside of ourselves that challenges and is rebellious, we also have a Moses inside of ourselves that s- sits there quietly. And when you study Torah, and when you allow yourself to be have bittel, humble, and suspend your opinion, that's the healthiest way you're going to yourself discover the Moses within you and the Moses within others. Because what you also find is that arrogance breeds arrogance. You know, you find that, say, a teacher or a, or a rabbi who's arrogant, he usually brings out arrogance in you, and then your arrogance brings out more arrogance in that person, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Whereas if you introduce into your life some bittel, doesn't mean that the people around you necessarily deserve your, uh, your respect, but you still doesn't mean that you should become arrogant just because everyone else is arrogant. You'll start finding that around you, people who have that humility, and it becomes a force that's also a ripple effect the other way around, a vicious cycle in the positive sense that humility breeds humility. So these are some of the lessons that we can take out from this chapter that I believe are indispensable if you really apply it to your life. I don't think anyone here is uh, immune or does not have some of the challenges I described here. And it's really about how to make moves in your life because that's what we need someone to help us with. You're stuck here, what do you do next? And how, who do you turn to? If the leaders are corrupt, who do you turn to? Turn to yourself, everyone's holy, that's very good, but we don't necessarily have the strength on our own. So Korach's question forces us to look for that humility, and the answer, of course, is that there is a Moses everywhere and in every situation. I may not be in the full flesh of a Moses as it was then, but every generation has its challenge, and in our own small microcosmic way we can find that type of uh, force. So, may we all be blessed with uh, accessing the humility that's in everybody's soul and that we uh, act on it and turn to each other and we can help each other. And please do not, even if you find there's a rabbi that deserves to be um, what's it called, pillaged. <laughs> Is that the word? Pillory. 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 Whatever. Yeah. I don't know if we should do that. Yeah. So it says at the end of the Talmud in Saita that one of the signs of Mashiach's times is that there'll be chutzpah. That the uh, young will embarrass the old, which means that there will be disrespect. They're called um, insolence. Is the word. So on one hand, that's not considered necessarily a positive virtue, but when the systems are, are screwed up, chutzpah can help to change the status quo, which is very much what the rebellion of the 60s was about, and any rebellion has elements of positive. So the key is to be rebellious, however, in a context of humility, because rebellion on its own could also become a very strong, arrogant force, because you, you, you justify your rebellion, you're rebelling against bad things. We shouldn't learn from those bad things, that when we rebel, we should not do it the way it was done to us, which means with humility. So use your chutzpah well, and uh, I uh, look forward to the next class. Next Wednesday night, it's very likely I will not be giving this class. I'll be traveling to Sydney, Australia. If anybody wants to come with me. Um, so maybe we'll do is a web, a web broadcast from there to here. That's interesting. I don't know about that. But I will notify you by email. So if you don't have, we don't have your email address, please put it on the list specifically. And there's, a, there's an email that goes out to those that come to the class so you can know updates, last minute updates, etc. And share with friends. And um, we're going to look for someone to fill in my shoes. I don't want to make any commitments until I uh, discuss it with the appropriate uh, parties. So stay tuned, and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. But uh, meanwhile, if you ever if you miss me, you can always go to meaningfullife.com. There's a whole series of archives of these webcasts that are not just after they're live; they're also put up now. You can just watch them, so you can. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so and I want to say finally, the class is dedicated in memory of Rivka Bat Rachel, right? So from Jeff, mother-in-law of Ayala Dwiner just passed away just a few days ago. And happy birthday to Michael Horn, to Ellen Almalo, Eric Targan. And everyone should have a very good night, a good week.
and uh, keep me posted as updates to the subject matter that we discussed here tonight. Yes. Anybody wants to dedicate a class or anything like that, please see you myself or Val Bold, who's here okay. usually every Wednesday. We'll help you out. If there's any way we can help you, please just call us. Good night, everybody. Thank you.